actually come from the revival of ancient vibrational methods that were released in the modern day by a group of Jesuit-trained French priests beginning in around 1900. And they began to reveal their methods to test subtle vibrational energies. We'll be looking at some of those techniques on that Thursday. And I think he's got the best summary of metaphysical ideas in the Western world. I think it's very helpful. There are other ways to look at the human subtle bodies, but this is a helpful introduction to understanding the way that we have multiple levels to ourselves. So one way to look at it is that as we go to the level of the Godhead, the creator of all things, beyond polarity, beyond gender, beyond any manifestation, that pure consciousness field of the Godhead, as it manifests in the human being, this becomes the source of what in the Rosicrucian tradition is called the I am presence. This is the spirit core. This is the human self-awareness, what allows us to say I am. As this light moves down through the planes, the mind of God basically is emanated as a fractal in human beings, as the mind of the human being. And this is connected to what we think of as the astral plane and the astral light. It has no place to come from but the mind of God. And so the mind of the human being is a direct emanation of that. If you read the early Christian texts, such as those coming from Origen, Origen was a great church father living in Alexandria, Egypt, in the third century AD. He wrote a remarkable book called On First Principles. He describes this process of emanation from the Godhead through the solar logos, which in Christianity is referred to as the Christ, into manifestation of the human being. And so these concepts here of higher forms manifesting all the aspects of the human being is really a universal teaching in East and West. And in the West, of course, we call it the Hermetic teachings, as above, so below. As this light moves down through the plane to the next level, it vibrates. And this vibrational force creates what we think of as universal life energy. In China, we refer to it as qi, or the universal qi field. It can also be called qi or prana. And this becomes the foundation of the vibrational life body of the human <coughs> being. Following the Greeks, in the West today, we tend to call this the etheric. Then as it moves into the level of matter, and the term matter is actually related to a feminine receptacle for the light of God that can give birth into the physical world, with the relationship between mater, mother, and matter. So the light crystallizes into matter and becomes the physical body of the human being. In Sanskrit, the Sanskrit term for the human physical body translates as the sheep made of food. Essentially, we take the food from the physical earth, we transform it during life, and it becomes our physical body. By the same token, we take the universal life force and we use that for our etheric life body. We take that universal mind substance and use it as the substance of our mind and the astral body. And then that core of the beingness from the highest levels of divine becomes the core of our I am presence. There's another aspect of this I'd like to bring out, which is that when the light decays past the point of the level of matter, it begins to break up and it forms radiation. And this radiation aspect is what in the work of Rudolf Steiner in the West, he would sometimes refer to as sub-nature. And this is related to what we think of as the electromagnetic spectrum of radiation. What this means is that electromagnetic energies in the forms we think of them today are in fact not life energy. They are life energy decayed past the level of the material plane. And at that point, breaking up, radiating, and forming the electromagnetic spectrum. This concept that electromagnetic energies and light energies are not identical is extremely important for understanding vibrational science and vibrational physics. The two are deeply connected, but the electromagnetic is at a much grosser level and is, in many cases, in a process of decay and radiation. So this is a foundation for us for understanding what Many of you have been exposed to in terms of mental dowsing. The most popular form of mental dowsing today is to be taught a particular system where you ask a mental question and the pendulum will move in a particular way. The movement of the pendulum 
gives you an answer, yes or no, to the question. This type of mental dialing is actually related to tapping into the universal mind field, the universal consciousness. It's either a reception or a projection of thought forms. And unfortunately, I find that most mental dowsing circles, the whole link of mental dowsing to thought forms is not even discussed. And that's unfortunate. Because to understand what mental dowsing is all about, you have to understand thought forms. I have not found a major spiritual tradition that does not understand thought forms. They may not teach it in the church or the mosque or the synagogue in a public way, but all of their esoteric teachings deal with this. The power of the mind. The mind creates forms. Those forms have power. Rudolf Steiner used to say that there is no statement that is more untrue than you don't have to pay for your thoughts. He says thoughts are things. Thoughts have effects. And so at this higher level, when we look at mental dowsing, we have both receptive and active aspects of it. We can either clear the mind, like a surface of water described in the Eastern text, to be able to receive a clear reflection of higher worlds, or to get an answer to a mental question. And that's what, at the highest level, receptive mental dowsing would be. Or I could project that thought form to have a specific effect. And all esoteric traditions understand that process. But vibrational radiesthesia or vibrational dowsing is different. Whereas mental dowsing, if it's done correctly, is actually a form of spiritual initiation. Spiritual initiation to understand the power of thought forms, to understand the power of our mind, and to go into resonance with the mind of God, the universal thought field. Vibrational dowsing is an initiation of our life body, the vibrational etheric body, to be able to receive or project not thought forms, but vibrational information. Again, what we think of as chi and all its different forms in the Eastern tradition. This is achieving a resonance really with the life body of God, or universal life force. And so they are two different things. They feel very different than you when you do them. What this means is that when you study ancient methods, you find that they are using primarily methods in their vibrational work to be able to pick up specific vibrations or project specific vibrations. This type of knowledge was reintroduced, as I mentioned to you before, around 1900 by a group of Jesuit-trained French priests, Abbé Mermet, Abbé Dulé, and a number of others who began to reveal the secrets of how they worked with pendulums in particular to pick up all types of information or vibratory fields. This work was primarily vibrational. Also, the German rediscovery of the ancient knowledge of the Earth's energy fields and energy grids, primarily vibrational in nature. The most common tool that I find German dowsers using for this type of work is something called the Lecher antenna. And the Lecher antenna is setting an antenna to different wavelengths to pick up specific vibrations. They're not asking mental questions. They're actually picking up the Earth's energetic grid by tuning into it vibrationally. But we find a major shift in this type of work around World War II. Tremendous chaos set into Europe at this time, and the leading lights of this type of work were based in Europe, particularly in France and Germany. And what came out of this is a loss of a lot of understanding of the deeper science that had been developed, particularly in the 1930s, in France and in Germany. And a great spread of mental doubt because mental dowsing doesn't require as much training. It doesn't require as much understanding. It doesn't require an understanding of vibrational physics and vibrational science. It's a bit more straightforward. And so this developed into the most popular method being teaching you how to use a pendulum or a rod to ask questions and get a yes or no answer for its movement. Now this is mental dowsing in its receptive aspect because we know in mental dowsing that you will not get an accurate answer if you are actually projecting a thought form at that time. The way this is normally described in mental dowsing circles is not that way, but by saying, if you have an emotional investment in the outcome, you cannot douse it clearly. What's really happening is that you are holding an already existing thought form. It makes it difficult to pick up information clearly because the thought form you're projecting forms a screen in front of you. You can't clearly pick up the information behind it. Now, there's another very popular form 
that we've seen really pick up speed in the last 15 uh, or so years in dowsing circles. And that is using dowsing for setting intent, or what is often called programming, a particular outcome. And this is really the projection of thought forms, whether it's for the healing of a person, or the healing of a space, or transforming energies, whatever it might be. This is an active aspect of mental dowsing. Another aspect that has become more popular over the last 15 years is asking or finding a person's personality commanding the aid of elemental or spiritual beings. And so we see quite a bit of this work happening today also being called mental dowsing. And it's usually done at the mental level. There's no testing of the actual vibrations present. When we can test the vibrations that are actually present, this opens up something very important for us, which is what St. Paul referred to as testing the spirits. He says you have to test the spirits. How do you test the spirits to know what their actual quality is? And there are ways to vibrationally test them to know what that quality is, which we'll get to a little bit later. So with vibrational dowsing and mental dowsing, asking mental questions is receptive. And as I mentioned before, our thought forms that we project can obscure true answers. We have to be able to hold the mind clear. Mental dowsing is not normally taught this way, but one of the best ways I think to teach mental dowsing would be similar to the way that the power of the mind was taught in classical spiritual traditions, which is beginning with practices such as in Buddhism, the practice of mindfulness, or in Rosicrucianism, the practice of the six basic exercises to do such things as to be able to observe your thinking your feeling and emotions, and your will impulses. Mindfulness and self-observation is the foundation of any type of clear mental dowsing, in my opinion, because that's the only thing that makes us aware of what am I generating all the time that I'm not even aware of with my mind and my feeling and my will forces at the three primary centers of the body. Virtually every tradition in the planet talks about three major energy centers of the body, which in Rosicrucianism are thinking, feeling, and willing, are head, heart, and para, are upper, middle, and lower dantian, are head, heart, and hands, are thought, speech, and action. Different ways that's going to be described whether you train with a Sufi, or a Buddhist, or a Taoist priest, but they're all talking about the same three energy centers in the head, in the heart, and in the will centers of the belly. Directed intent methods are active. We actually have to create a thought form to create an effect this way. Now with vibrational dowsing, we can actually test the quality of the thought form that is generated. When we use mental dowsing to ask the effect of directed intent work, our own projected thought form can distort the answer. Let me give you an example. Someone goes into a space and they do mental dowsing as their major energy line running through the space various things having to do with the energetics of the location. And then they program the location for, I'm going to transmute the energy line, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And then they ask the mental question, has all the work been accomplished? Yes. And then they program it, this will last for 10,000 years. Then they test, is it going to work for 10,000 years? Yes. Unfortunately, in many cases of this kind, I've come behind it and tested vibrationally. And two days later, there's nothing there. The vibrations have already shifted. Not necessarily, it can last for a fairly long period of time if the person really has very strong energetics to create stabilized thought forms. But in many cases, it's shifted very, very quickly, particularly in toxic locations where there's a lot of electromagnetic pollution. Because it's a physics equation of what's the amount of vibratory force generated by the thought form versus the vibratory force coming all the time from the electromagnetics of the location or other vibratory influences. So when the person's asking and getting a yes, it's going to last for 10,000 years, what they're actually testing is